Thank you for coming to our Dark Skies webinar. My name is Rita Larkin. I'm the Communications Director for the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, and we are so happy to have these presenters here from the Bear Observatory and the Earth to Sky um, Park at Mayland Community College in Burnsville, North Carolina. So first we're gonna hear from Margaret Early Teal. She is the Dean of Advancement at Mayland Community College. Then we're gonna hear from Kyle Lanning. He is the Bear Observatory Manager. And then finally, we're gonna get some great tips um, for viewing the night skies from Amanda Pastor. She is the Assistant Coordinator for the Earth to Sky Park. So um, without further ado, I will let Margaret take over. All right, thank you, Rita. I appreciate you letting us be a part of this today. We're really excited. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, so the Earth to Sky Park is located exactly halfway between Spruce Pine and Burnsville, North Carolina, right along the Tow River um, off of Highway 80 North. For those of you who are trying to find it and from the Blue Ridge Parkway, it's uh, maybe about a 15 to a 20 minute drive um, from the Spruce Pine exit. So, um, you know, we hope that you can come out and find us. Um, the Earth to Sky Park was originally a uh, mica mine way a long time ago. Um, once the mine closed, uh, there was a large hole in the ground and sort of up in this uh, field section here was where the mine was. And um, the, the counties, uh, Mitchell and Yancey County, took over the site and decided to turn the old mine into a landfill. And at that point, um, they, they filled the big hole in the ground with trash. Um, and it, it reached its full state um, in the 90s and they capped it. And that's what has created this large field that you can see in the aerial photo. Um, at that point, um, it, was, it became what was known as the Energy Exchange, which was a artist um, incubator space uh, where they built studios, which was all of these Quonset huts that you see along here. Um, and they used the methane from the landfill to power the artist studios. Um, so it had a glass uh, kiln, ceramic kilns, all the heat from the buildings was all powered off of the methane gas from the landfill. And that lasted about 12 years. And once the methane started to run out, um, the energy exchange closed and Malin Community College took over the site. Um, we used it as sort of a classroom space for a little while. And then um, we started to develop what is now the Earth to Sky Park, which is an environmental education park um, that allows visitors to study everything from the earth to the sky. And uh, our first step was to get International Dark Sky Association certification. And um, Amanda and Kyle are gonna talk a little bit more about that. So I won't go into it too much, but um, it, it allowed us to, um, be promoted as a place with very, very dark skies. Um, we had a lot of visitors coming from all over the world to, to see our dark skies, which is hugely exciting, um, but there was really nothing for them to do while they were there except bring their own equipment and, and do some stargazing. So at that point, we built the Bear Dark Sky Observatory, which you can see up on this knob up here in the aerial photo. And um, that just boomed. Um, we have the largest public telescope in the southeastern United States, and Kyle is going to talk a lot more about the observatory um, and, and how you can access it and what all you can do. Um, but we've been open for, it'll be six years in May uh, that we've been operational, and it is amazing what you can see through our telescope. Um, at that, about a year, well, I guess about three years ago, we decided uh, the observatory was great. We loved it. Um, but our biggest problem was weather. We, um, you can't stargaze when it's cloudy and you can't stargaze when it's raining or snowing. And uh, we ended up canceling about 60% of our observatory shows due to cloud cover. And when you've got people driving an average of three hours to attend our observatory events, um, that's pretty disappointing for folks. And so we built a planetarium and um, that is, you can see this is sort of an older photo, but there's the construction of the planetarium, which I'll, I'll get to again in, in just a minute with the next slide here. Um, so there you can see the construction of the planetarium. This is the lower park. Um, the planetarium has been open for a year. It'll be a year in July. 
Um, and that has enabled us to bring all of our stargazing and poor weather down into the planetarium. And so we can still offer guests the opportunity to learn about the night sky, as well as, um, you know, if it's sub-zero or sub-freezing temperatures, they can be in a nice warm environment in comfy chairs and still um, have a similar experience. It's not the same, of course, as looking through the telescope, but we have that option to offer people and it gives us a chance also to do field trips for our K-12 schools who cannot come at nighttime um, to, to learn about the night sky. The other parts of the park, um, you can see these Quonset huts here. Um, this is now the visitor center. Um, and then over here is a conference center where we can hold um, group meetings and um, there's some classroom space in there. And these other two buildings here are going to be transformed into a children's discovery center, which will provide hands-on STEM education um, for kids, both in applied engineering and robotics with a space twist to it, um, and then environmental ed education or environmental science in the other building. Um, we've got some old greenhouses here, which house an aquaponic system, which we are in the process of getting going. Uh, and that sort of is a nod to the earth side of the earth to sky park as well. Um, here is a close up of our Bear Dark Sky Observatory. It's named for Warren and Larissa Bear. So it's B-A-R-E, not bear like the grizzly bear. Um, and it's not a nudist colony either. So it's not bear as in, you know, bear as in nude, but uh, for the bear family. And um, we are, are thrilled to be able to have, um, in addition to the observatory and the roof, the entire roof rolls back off of this building and the telescope comes up. Um, and Kyle will talk more about all of that. But you can see around the building, we've got these um, telescope viewing stations and there are eight of them. And so even on nights where we have a sold out stargazing event at the observatory, um, or if we're closed um, and don't have an event, you are still welcome to come up to the observatory, bring binoculars if you don't have a telescope, um, bring your own telescope, bring astro astronomy or um, astrophotography equipment and get it all set up and do your own stargazing. Uh, part of the requirements of an International Dark Sky Association Park is that we are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, so by having these viewing stations, you're, you're allowed to come up there at any time. And um, during meteor showers, it's extremely popular. Um, there's often not a night where there's nobody up there on those viewing pads. Um, here, as you can see how the roof rolls back um, off of the building. Um, this again was taken during some construction. So there's, it looks a lot prettier now, um, but this is the aerial view looking down into the observatory. You can see our telescope, which um, is called the SAM scope in honor of Sam Phillips, who donated the telescope. And it's the largest public telescope in uh, North Carolina. We also have a smaller planetary telescope. Um, so guests, uh, we allow about 26 people in the planetarium or in the observatory at a time. And um, you can go between the two telescopes and you can also sit back in these zero gravity chairs when you're you're done looking through the telescopes and just let the, the stars come into your field of vision. It's incredible to be, be in those chairs um, when the Milky Way is up overhead. Um, here's a, a shot of an action night during the community viewing night. So you can see how the roof is rolled back and then the telescope comes up um, and people can climb up this ladder. This is a view from the top of our ladder looking down. Um, the steps. And this is the Milky Way at the observatory. It truly looks like this. This is how dark it is up there. Um, there's a lot of places along the Blue Ridge Parkway um, where you can also see the Milky Way. And Amanda will talk to you a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, but it's incredible the what you can see, especially if you live in the cities, you're not going to see stars like this. Um, and so we really encourage good stargazing up, up our way. And here's just a few more shots of the Milky Way that were taken from the park. Um, these were not astrophotography photos where there's long exposure time. 
Um, these were essentially taken with the equivalent of an iPhone. And here is the planetarium, the Glenn and Carol Arthur Planetarium. Um, this is after the building construction was completed, but before our good of the hive mural, which wraps around the entire building was completed. And Amanda will talk with you more about that mural and how special it is. Um, but our planetarium is very unique because in architecture, because it is a dome within a dome. Oftentimes you'll see a planetarium dome inside of a square building. Um, but this is, we did a geodesic dome um, and we have since been written up in architecture magazines about the efficiency of this design and the cost effectiveness of it um, and are becoming a, a showcase piece for, for future planetarium designs. Here is our visitor center. So um, if you're coming to the park, this will be your first stop um, to, to learn about what you can do, get planetarium tickets, get observatory schedules, um, and eventually get your tickets to go into the Children's Discovery Centers when they open. And this is the interior of the planetarium. So we have 60 seats um, and we show Traditional planetarium shows about astronomy. We also show other environmental education videos. We had one this winter about the Northern Lights. Um, there's one coming this summer about monarch butterflies. And um, we are also very excited to be able to offer laser light shows, which has no educational merit uh, or astronomy, stargazing um, qualities, but they are so much fun um, and a great uh, date night or source of entertainment. And there's nothing like that in our area. Um, and it's, it's so much fun. So you can rock out to Queen or the Beatles, or I think we've got um, David Bowie up this month and they're, they're really a lot of fun. So that's kind of all I have. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle Lanning, who is one of our managers up at the Bear Dark Sky Observatory. And he's gonna tell you all about the observatory. All right, thanks, Margaret. Um, I'm going to start uh, just briefly and talk about our new astronomy club. Um, we're excited to offer basically our newest form of community education, uh, which is the Earth to Sky Park Astronomy Club. And this is going to be a once a month occurrence um, that's going to be started on May 23rd at 8.30 p.m. Um, we're going to be talking about what's going on in the night sky, and it's basically just going to be like our monthly newsletter, except in person. Um, so if folks have their own telescopes and they want to set up on those concrete viewing pads that Margaret was talking about, um, that will be available. Um, we won't be using our equipment, but if you have your own equipment, especially if you want to join the club just because, hey, I've got a telescope, but I don't really know how to use it. That is the perfect opportunity for you to come and, and use it in a dark sky environment that will uh, hopefully encourage you to continue using it more. So it's basically just going to be a mini star party that we're going to offer uh, about once a month. Um, and this is also kind of a push towards our IDA uh, certification. It's going to keep us in good standing with our community as far as offering education on keeping our, our naturally dark skies very dark. Um, in the future, we hope to plan to bring in guest speakers um, and offer a space for astrophotography. Um, but again, we're going to be really starting with a heavy push on Telescope 101. Um, how to use your own equipment, and then just, you know, have people come and, and learn about the night sky. Um, we will discuss the IDA at every one of our meetings and talk about their mission goals. Um, and this is hopefully going to be a push to help our community feel empowered to discuss the IDA and, and to kind of take charge in the community um, for some much needed lighting control. Um, we're going to also advertise any local IDA events that people might be interested in, in coming to see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick and talk a little bit more about the observatory and how to get you up here. All right. All right, so here's an overview again of our observatory, and this is kind of on our eastern side where you can see three of those concrete viewing pads that Margaret spoke about. And this is also a really good shot of how our roof rolls back. 
Um, you know, a lot of observ observatories have uh, maybe a dome um, and they have just a little slit for uh, the telescope to look through. Um, but just because of our elevation, which is just under 2,700 feet, uh, and our great aerial view, as you can kind of see there, um, we elected to go with the, the square building that the roof completely rolls off of, and that offers a really great experience um, for people that get there at, at sundown. Um, it's a great place to watch the sunset right before an event, um, but you can also see um, our uh, ramp. And so we, we're we doing our very best to be um, ADA compliant. And our ramp there allows guests of, of, of all abilities to make their way up to the observatory. Um, just to our to the left of this image here, um, we do have handicapped parking uh, that allows you to drive pretty much all the way up to the observatory. And then you've got your ramp for access. Um, and that's just a way to bring the night sky to everyone. Um, Margaret mentioned about people coming up to use these concrete pads for meteor showers. And while that is a, a major uh, sight to see, um, we often, even on non-peak nights, will see at least three or four in a two-hour session. Um, those zero-gravity chairs are a great opportunity for you just to kind of relax and, and look for them. Um, you can't see them if you're not looking up, and those, those zero-gravity chairs do a good job of facilitating that. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about our scopes. Um, and different types of events. And then um, as Rita pointed out, if there's any questions there at the end, we'll be happy to, to field those. Um, here's another view of our SAM scope. Um, our SAM scope, again, as Margaret mentioned, is the largest scope in the Southeast for public viewing. We have a 34 inch diameter mirror uh, that is kind of encased in this open body design. This sheath here is just a piece of fabric that helps keep the dust off of our mirror. And then our planetary scope is in the back that was donated to us. It's a fantastic 14 inch mead scope. And what that allows us to do instead of having, you know, a full 26 person event with one person on the scope and everybody else waiting in line, uh, that allows us to kind of split off into two groups um, and, and view, you know, exponentially more. You know, you'd think that would double your amount of objects, but we've found that it gets people moving. It gets people excited, asking good questions. Um, and it allows us to get through quite a bit of stuff um, in that two hour time, <clears throat> excuse me, time frame. Here's another aerial shot. Um, just note that if, if you are planning to come and use our SAM scope, you can see our ladder here that looks kind of small from this, but it's, it's about a 12 footer. Um, and it uh, allows us to see things high in the night sky because you might notice here, um, our eyepiece is actually at the top of the scope. So when this thing is looking directly overhead, you got to do a little bit of a climb. Um, that is mitigated with our, our smaller scope. If, if you don't want to climb the ladder or are not able to, um, you can see just about anything in the smaller scope that you can see in the big scope, um, and you don't have to uh, do any climbing. Um, here is a, a shot that kind of shows that open body design, and I'll kind of draw your attention over here. This is our mirror, um, the 34 inch. It's basically the powerhouse of, of, the, of the scope. Um, Oftentimes when we're showing objects that are very, very far away, um, people think we're looking at, you know, three, four, five thousand times magnification, and that's not the case. Uh, depending on what eyepiece we are using at the time, we might be looking at 60 times magnification. But with that resolving power of that mirror, it basically takes any available light and focuses it to the center of that mirror, and then that is what's reflected into our eyepiece. Um, and I'll talk about a little um distance here in, in just a minute when we uh, uh, show some pictures of some of the objects we regularly see. Um, but you can see on the floor here, this rotates 360 degrees. And then on this point here, it rotates 90 degrees uh, straight up. And that's part of how we align it. Um, but basically in a two hour show um, and, and the types of shows that we have, um, right now we're offering what we call a dark sky uh, show or a, a community viewing night for dark sky viewing. And that's going to be a, a two hour show capped at around 25 or six people. Um, and then you can also uh, join us for a one hour show if the moon is above about 35 to 40%. And we bill those as moon madness nights, um, where we talk a little bit more about lunar history, uh, not just our moon, but other moons in our solar system. Um, and show a lot of good pictures of our moon through the telescope, including with color filters, which is always really fun. 
And then if, if, um, if you're not interested in a large group setting, or maybe you've got a, a family reunion or an anniversary or birthday coming up, you can also contact us at my email, observatory at malon.edu, and you can schedule a private viewing. Um, and, and, you know, if you want to reach out to me, we can talk about how the, the pricing differentiates between those types of events. <clears throat> um, but just to tell you a little bit about what that scope can do and, and not give you a 20-minute math lesson, basically what we use for stellar magnitude is, is a reverse logarithmic function. So the more negative something is, the easier it is for people to see. So you can kind of see, and it looks like my image came a little blurry here. I'm sorry about that. Um, the sun is about negative 27. You can see the sun. The full moon on a clear cloudless night is about a negative 12. You can definitely see that. Venus is a good object to look at this time of year. Um, if you ever look up in the night sky right now and think, man, that star is a lot brighter than everything else. It's not a star. It's probably Venus. Um, and that's approaching zero. And Sirius, our, our brightest star in the wintertime skies, our north star, Polaris, is about plus three. And then you start getting more and more on the positive side. And you'll notice that the human naked eye limitation is about a plus six, give or take. Well, what our scope does for us is puts us about plus 18. And as I understand it, that's going to offer about 700 million objects in the northern hemisphere that you can't see with the naked eye that are visible in the scope. Um, and so that just kind of gives you a little point of reference for what our scope can do. My favorite thing to do in the scopes, while I like to look at planets and really bright objects, I love pointing my laser at a blank area of space and showing to you that it is, in fact, not a blank area of space. There are stars all around, uh, even in these spots that we don't see a whole lot with our naked eye. Um, examples of what we would show you like that. This is M11 or the Wild Duck Cluster, uh, about 6,200 light years away just at that cusp of what most folks might be able to see with the naked eye, but here's what it would look like through our scope. Um, another one is the Great Globular Cluster of Hercules, about 25,000 light years away. Again, could be for certain people a naked eye object. Uh, certainly can get it in binoculars, but if you want to see it in full detail, definitely want to check that out in our telescope. Um, another example two star clusters that our colleague Michael likes to show that I've really became fond of, uh, NGC 844 and 869. Uh, these are a little bit more visible, you know, depending on your, your uh, level of vision um, with the naked eye, but certainly look fantastic in our scope. Um, but what I'm most proud of that I've been able to accomplish at our observatory is showing this. Now, this is I'll preface by saying a, a graphic representation, um, but the furthest I was able to reach out with our scope is about 127 million light years away, each one of those light years being almost 6 trillion miles. So that's a ton of zeros. Um, this is well over six. So you're, you know, you're almost at a plus 12 there. And this is not even close to remotely visible with the naked eye. Um, but what I was able to do with a small group uh, of folks that stuck around towards the end of one of our events several months ago, I pointed at this object and I didn't tell anybody what it was, 127 million light years away. And I said, what do you see? And everybody in the group was able to tell me two spirals. So the fact that our scope can do that, it's just, I mean, it's just a testament to what we're able to, to do up here at the park. Um, some other things that we concentrate on, this image here was taken of the moon with our red filter on one of our moon madness nights. This is a crude cell phone image that I got with my phone of Saturn, and it looks so much better when you're actually viewing it. I had to kind of take a screenshot of a video, so lost a lot of resolution there, but I put this image of Saturn in. Uh, we see the Cassini division between the rings here, and that is something that with good conditions at our park, we can definitely uh, show you. And then this image of Jupiter here with a moon in transit, uh, the gentleman that donated our Mead scope actually comes up pretty often to see uh, moons in transit across the face of Jupiter, which is a really fun uh, thing to show folks. And then here's a view of our uh, planetary scope in the back. Again, it's a 14 inch Mead. It's a fantastic uh, uh, piece of equipment. And you see our candy here a lot of times, especially if we've got some youngsters uh, with parental or adult consent, we will often give out Milky Ways or Starburst. Uh, as a, a reward for answering astronomy questions. Um, but I've talked about our types of events. 
Again, if you if you would like to schedule a private, that's going to be at observatory at maven.edu. Uh, if you would like to buy tickets for a public event, um, you can just go to Malin's website, maven.edu. Um, historically, you had to go through a few buttons to get there, but now they have placed at the top right of our website uh, a little skeletonized telescope. You can click right on that, and it's going to take you to our third-party vendor uh, for ticketing. Um, and uh, if you don't get tickets for something and you're in the area, all of those concrete pads that Margaret talked about, um, those are first come, first serve. And while I have worked several events where several of them have been filled up, I have yet to work one where all eight have been filled up. So definitely, you know, don't get discouraged. Come on out. And uh, a lot of times, you know, if I'm one of the persons on the scope, um, then I will definitely check the pads to see who's out there and, and you know, kind of show you around our observatory as we're wrapping up and maybe even show you what we've got, you know, last pulled up. Um, lastly, just a little bit about our planetarium um, on top of what Margaret said, and then I'll, I'll pass it off to Amanda. Um, we do, you know, a lot of weather, weather mitigation with our planetarium, um, but, you know, we are not just trying to move people down there because, oh, well, we couldn't do it. That, that really was an option for us to say, hey, I know you've already got lodging because you're coming from four hours away. And because of our GPS beacon on top of the dome, we can still show you uh, a really good star show based on where you're sitting. Um, but we also offer some really cool programming that Amanda's gonna talk about. Um, but I just wanted to point out that in the event of, of you know, unforeseen weather circumstances, or you know, we might know 36 to 48 hours in advance that the weather's not gonna cooperate, um, we're going to shoot you guys an email that have tickets and say, hey, here's the situation. Um, and you will always have the option of saying, yes, the planetarium show sounds awesome. I'm still in or nope, I'd like to reschedule for the next dark sky event and we'll make that happen. Um, but I look forward to hearing any questions towards the end. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it back off to Rita so she can get Amanda in here. And thank you all for coming out today. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, we're really lucky to have you and uh, and the whole uh, team up there in Burnsville, uh, right off the parkway. It's um, right in the parkway's backyard, so we feel really fortunate. All right, um, we are going to hand it over to Amanda. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Rita. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. I'm hoping. That's good. Awesome. <clears throat> so um, as uh, Margaret and Kyle both had mentioned that we are a uh, dark sky, international dark sky location, uh, the way that that has been, um, the way that you get certified for that is that you actually have to do light meter readings. And uh, the way that you do that is you have to go out uh, kind of quarterly and use a special device, a light meter, uh, on the darkest nights possible when your brightest planets are not above the horizon, when there's no moon in the sky, and take readings at your site, and then those are averaged. We submit them to the International Dark Sky Association, and then we are graded based on those numbers. So as uh, Margaret said, I believe we were um, number 22 on the IDA list, and now there's over 400 sites uh, uh, in the country that are uh, International Dark Sky certified as well. And uh, that is that website itself is where you can go, uh, depending on where you are in the world, and find a dark sky, especially if you live in a city. So we're rated as a, a three on this one to nine scale that they have. So we're a rural sky. Uh, and you can see the difference on the scale, just how bleached out the sky gets um, the, the further out of the countryside or the rural areas that you get and you get closer towards the cities. Uh, so this is the, the light meter reading and, and I'm sorry, this is actually on a Bortle scale. Um, that, that is the scale that they use um, to determine based on your light meter readings, kind of where you sit. So this is the actual Bortle, Bortle scale itself that runs from one to nine with a one being the best. The light meter readings are on a different type of scale. They are based on uh, your numbers that you get and their, their scale goes from zero to 22 with a 22 being the darkest, which would be like your Grand Canyon. Uh, the best readings that we've ever gotten were as this uh, 21.79 and this 21.71. And you can see there that 17.04 uh, is, a, is a 
a lower number, and that's just an example of um, the different readings that you can get. But we always tell people about this 21.79 because it's a good way to put it in perspective for just how dark it can be out here at the at the park and up at the observatory. Uh, this is another picture of uh, the observatory with the SAM telescope, and uh, that is Blair, the coordinator of the park, with her astronomy laser, uh, just pointing up at the Milky Way there, and this was in the middle of summer, and the only thing kind of impeding our view at all is just this bit of wispy cloud that's coming through, uh, but the, sorry, we have a field trip on its way out uh, from visiting earlier this morning, if you can hear them, but um, but this is an unedited picture. It was just taken again, just with a cell phone, um, which these cell phones nowadays are just incredible with what we can capture. But the the darkness there and that contrast of all of that Milky Way is just stunning. And so many people have never seen the Milky Way. Uh, so a huge part of our uh, education here at the park, as far as the, the sky education, has to do with light pollution and how to preserve the darkness and um, how to mitigate the development of um, cities and things like that and the way that they light up the night and their properties because uh, you can really make a huge difference just by simply changing the uh, type of lighting fixtures that you use. Uh, we The main thing is uh, not using fixtures that blast light out into the sky kind of unnecessarily, um, rather having fixtures that are angled down towards the ground or even just putting a shroud over the fixture. Um, it also makes a huge difference the spectrum of light that uh, of the bulbs that you are using. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit as far as from the, the Earth standpoint uh, of the education that we always include for guests when they come to the park. Uh, which is the dangers that, that the light pollution can cause to our nighttime pollinators. So uh, we're very lucky here to have a stunning uh, mural that was done by the artist Matthew Willey as part of his project, The Good of the Hive. And uh, that project, it's a 21-year project that he's seven years into, and he is painting 50,000 honeybees all over the world to bring awareness to the dangers of our pollinators, but he usually only does bees. And so you can see here, he was uh, work putting in the finishing touches on the mural here uh, back in 2022. And uh, because of the, the weather and the seasons that we have here and how it can get so cold, uh, the first piece that he worked on was actually this queen room, which is right in the foyer of the um, planetarium here uh, at the park. And so what's very special just about this is that he gave us this stunning uh, queen bee here in the center surrounded by all of her scout bees. And uh, he doesn't do queen bees in many locations. Uh, but after he left and then came back after the winter, he had kind of a vision of how he wanted to modify the mural for us to match our mission here. And so if we go back um, to this slide, this is a panoramic of uh, the outside of the planetarium and the continuation of that mural. So uh, what we were looking at was over in this corner where the rest of the hive comes out from inside the foyer of the building. But what he decided to change was he wanted to include our nighttime pollinators. And so all of these moths that you see here uh, are, are native to this area and they're very important nighttime pollinators. And he also included um, our regular fireflies and then a very special type of firefly, which is only in um, a, a very small region of the Blue Ridge Mountains. I think they range from up around Watauga County down as far as Black Mountain, but they that is the only place that they are um, uh, in the country. And so uh, their life cycle is entirely different than our yellow fireflies. Uh, only the males fly. And uh, because of that, uh, their territory, they don't spread out in population very, very much. It's a very small amount at about a meter per year. And the females are ground dwelling and they lay their eggs in about six inches of topsoil. So, uh, and it also takes the larva about two years to develop into adults. So it takes a very long time for their life cycle to complete. And so if there's any land development at all, a uh, bulldozer can just come through one time and just decimate a population. So we are very thankful he included that as well. Uh, uh, and this is a diagram that we have here that one of our teammates made that's just beautiful. It tells you what every single species is that you're looking at. 
And then on the back side, it has the actual um, uh, images of the insects themselves. But our nighttime pollinators, a lot of people don't really think about moths um, and things like that, or beetles, even this stag beetle is also on the mural as an integrate, integrate that does not sound like the right word, but I think it is um, uh, part of our, our pollination cycle. So scientists did studies uh, in rural meadows where they put up LED streetlights um, in one section of the meadow and then in another section, they didn't. And what they found was 62% uh, uh, fewer of our pollinators um, uh, visited the meadow with the light. And so because of that, uh, they realized that the um, the fruits and plants weren't getting pollinated, so the crops were much, much less. It was 13% fewer crops with the plants that they were observing. And so what they found was that uh, the pollinators that work during the day were not able to make up the difference of the pollination that the pollinators at night were not able to complete because of the, the light um, impeding them being able to find the plants that they pollinate. And there are several species that are interdependent with each other, uh, specifically our um, evening primrose moth. Uh, here you can see our evening primrose. This is a flower that only blooms at night and it only has one pollinator and that is our, um, our evening primrose moth here. So the flower um, blooms at dusk and opens up and is open all night long until dawn, uh, at which time it starts to close. And the uh, primrose moth actually sleeps inside of the bloom during the day. And then as it opens at dusk, it, it repeats that cycle and does its pollination. So without the evening primrose, we would not be able to have the primrose moth. And so um, not only do our pollinators need specific plants, some of them as far as their, their species requirements, they need the darkness so they can find those plants. Uh, just like our lights outside of on our porch and things like that, disorient moths, and you've got them flying around and smacking into the bulb, uh, that kind of thing uh, is what uh, is so detrimental. And light pollution also isn't just something that affects our, our bugs and our wildlife, it actually affects every living thing on earth because if there's not enough darkness, then it disrupts the circadian rhythms in our bodies. And people that actually live in um, cities and, and work um, in buildings that are lit up at night are actually at higher risk for um, uh, breast and prostate cancer because of those circadian rhythms being disrupted. So preserving the night sky is just overall good for the health of the entire planet. Uh, this is uh, a close-up image of our blue ghost, one of our blue ghost fireflies that are on the mural. This is a male. Uh, this is an actual image of uh, the firefly itself. And then you can see this time lapse of the blue ghost uh, during the three week period that they, they breed during the summertime and just how low to the ground uh, they actually fly. Um, but so just, those are just examples of our, our pollinators. And we use that, that mural as a teaching tool for every single field trip that comes, uh, any kind of uh, events that we have, even just any guests that happen upon the park or they're here waiting for a planetarium show to begin or a laser show or something like that. We always say, before you leave, you've got to go check out this mural because it's just amazing. And uh, it's also his most comprehensive mural to date that he's done. We have his 10,000th bee. We have a queen bee that he gave us. And he also even gave us a drone bee, which is really, really special. Uh, but going on to talk about stargazing as far as the Blue Ridge Parkway is concerned, uh, I live very close to the parkway. I'm about a quarter mile uh, from the, the Spruce Pine area, just off of Alta Pass Highway. And... Uh, so I have several spots that I really, really like, but uh, what I've learned over time is uh, that there are more Eastern facing overlooks uh, within about a 20 mile um, uh, distance from where I turn onto the parkway or even from the Spruce Pine exit if you're getting onto the parkway at the Mineral Museum there. Uh, but most of the overlooks look East, which is great, especially if you're trying to get sunrises and things like that. Uh, but if you're looking for sunsets or something specific like a, a, a astronomy event, like say a lunar eclipse, 
then you may need a western facing uh, overlook. So um, the, these three here are ones that I really enjoy using um, that face east. There's Bearden Overlook, uh, Hefner Gap Overlook, and then Deer Lick Gap, which is this one here. This photo is one that I took um, on sunrise uh, just after the uh, total lunar eclipse that we experienced back in November. So um, they're, they're all three really great uh, dark dark valleys so that you can see the clear night sky. You're not impeded by any businesses um, or it, there happens to be the town down in the valley with, with some of our overlooks and things like that, or even just residential areas. Uh, but if you're looking for west, then these three are, are my favorites that I use a lot. Uh, this image here on the, uh, on the right is, uh, it's not very good. It's a cell phone image. I didn't have my tripod with me, but I was able to hold still enough to get a little bit of detail during the, um, during the peak of the lunar eclipse back in November. And, uh, but uh, Chestoa View Overlook is great. It's a little bit of a walk. It's not a long trail, but what it takes you down to is a really beautiful um, stone balcony overlook with a pretty wide open western facing sky. So it's great for sunset and it's great for um, just if, depending on what region of the sky, what astronomy object you're trying to look at. Um, the North, North Toe River Valley Overlook is also wonderful, um, but this one was taken at Three Knobs Overlook and uh, as soon as it finished, what was great is that Deer Lit Gap Overlook is literally maybe an eighth of a mile down the road from it. So as soon as that was finished, um, because it 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 was ending uh, around dawn, um, I hopped in my truck and then just went right down the road and was able to catch this stunning, one of the prettiest sunrises I've gotten on the parkway so far. Um, but when you are on the parkway, the thing about it is... Uh, you, there's traffic out there, even even in the wee morning hours, especially people that might uh, use it to uh, get to that spruce pine exit to then go down the mountain, say if they work at the uh, Baxter's down in, in Marion. Uh, so you you are going to deal with folks coming by you uh, after you've gotten all set up, even if you're just sitting in your car stargazing or if you've got a scope or a camera. Uh, so uh, I've got some tips that I want to share as far as how to make it the best experience and not let those uh, the the sudden light coming around a corner from headlights of a vehicle affect you. So uh, first and foremost, whenever you are going to be stargazing, you want to invest in just a little tiny red flashlight of some kind, uh, and that is because. Uh, red is a mu much more gentle wavelength of light on our eyes. We have all kinds of um, thousands and thousands of rods and cones in the back of our eyes, which are how our eyes adjust to different lighting conditions. And once your eyes have adjusted to darkness, if they get shocked by simply you picking up your cell phone without thinking about it, or again, if uh, a car comes around and you instinctively turn to look at that car, you're going to get blinded just like a poor deer or a possum out on the road. Um, and it takes about 10 minutes for your eyes to readjust to the darkness. Uh, so we always tell folks up at the observatory before the events begin, please dim your screen on your cell phone all the way down. And if you can avoid pulling it out at all, that would, that's the best uh, best way to go about it. Uh, but that red wavelength of light um, is also why uh, brake lights on cars are red versus being white like headlights so that you don't get blinded every time someone comes to a stop in front of you. And of course, the other way to uh, prevent that that shock, that night blindness from headlights on the parkway when you're observing is if you hear a car coming, then just avert your eyes or simply close them until that car passes by so that you don't have to deal with that shock and having to readjust your eyes. Um, the other thing that we do with our observatory planning for our events uh, is, and what you want to do for your own stargazing is to base when you're going to go out um, and enjoy the night sky on the lunar cycle. So the best dark skies are going to be a couple of days before the new moon and then about 10 to 12 days afterwards as the lunar cycle is coming back around to that full moon. And the, that's because the fuller the moon, uh, the more bleached out the sky will be. And uh, But there's also moon rise and moon set time. So for instance, right now the moon is not, the moon is still, um, uh, I think it's a, at about 60% right now because we're coming off of a full moon. But uh, because of the moon rise times, right now it's coming up around one o'clock in the morning. So you could still 
have a good stargazing night when the moon is in a more illuminated portion of its monthly cycle, but it, you just want to make sure you know exactly when it's going to rise and when it's going to set. And the other thing is when you're looking for places to stargaze on the parkway, if you're not nearby any of the ones I mentioned, because there's so many to choose from, um, you just want to look for ones that don't have many homes or businesses on the hillsides or on the mountainsides, as well as down in the valleys themselves. And that's, again, just to allow for better uh, and darker conditions so that won't impede your viewing. Um, the other part of, uh, of stargazing is, of course, taking into consideration the weather. Uh, this is a um, uh, website that we use regularly to try to make our weather calls. Uh, we use at least five different metrics uh, for that. And as a team, we talk back and forth and try to make as close a call as we can uh, coming up to event time. And but we live in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's a temperate rainforest, technically. And so the weather can change on a dime. So there's always uh, you know, weather predictions that seem like they might be great. And then because of where we are in a microclimate, it might change. Uh, so we do our best, but we always recommend to people um, a couple of these different options. And this in particular, particular is uh, on cleardarksky.com. I've got the link for all of these in the last slide, but it's based on color. And the easiest way to read these is the darker the blue, the better the viewing. And um, so your cloud covers the top one. Uh, so this darkness here, this is for tonight actually. So we've got a pretty clear sky up until about midnight or so. There's just a little bit of probably wispy clouds that might come through. And same here, this cloud cover, um, uh, it's a different type of charting. So, but you're still looking for these darker blues. The transparency has to do with what's in the sky. So uh, just like our light pollution is an issue, the, the main reason it's also an issue is because any particulate matter that's in the sky, whether it's dust or pollen or smoke or just humidity, picks up those photon particles of light and then causes that sky glow. So your transparency and your seeing are gonna refer to how clear the actual sky conditions are. Um, and then the darkness here on the bottom, again, this is also what you're looking for in particular with your lunar cycle. So um, this whiteness here just means that the moon is up during these hours and is going to possibly compromise uh, your viewing. Uh, this down here is kind of also has to do with the particulates that might be in the air. Uh, and again, the darker blue is, is exactly what you are looking for. Uh, another one that we use all the time is astrophoric. This is one of my favorites. And same thing, you're just going by color coding. So your times are up here. Uh, and again, this is for tonight and it matches pretty closely. Uh, so you want to you want to cross reference whatever metrics you're using. Uh, and then lastly, these are just some resources for you. We've got the Earth to Sky Park link here. This is also the International Dark Sky Association website link. It's going to uh, take you to all kinds of different resources for different locations that you can visit. It'll tell you where they sit on the Bortle scale, uh, also different activities, and they do a lot of webinars and things like that that are free to the public. Uh, Kyle had mentioned the observatory at mainland.edu email. You can also uh, sign up for our Earth to Sky Park Astronomy Club by just shooting an email over there and letting us know your information. Uh, and then this is a lunar cycle calendar, uh, time and date. It's the most reliable one. You can look at the lunar phases for years to come. Uh, but if you want to check and see where you're at in the month, so when you're planning your stargazing nights, it's a great uh, uh, resource. Um, the Website I just uh, the first one that I showed you that shot there of the sky chart is this link here and it's uh, set for uh, the Earth to Sky Park itself but you can type in uh, different locations and it will bring you up the the current uh, conditions for that area. Uh, here's for the astrophoric the second slide there and then down here if, if you're going to do any kind of stargazing definitely you want to at least invest in one good stargazing app. Uh, Sky Guide here at the top is my favorite. I have an iPhone. I've been using it for years now. It's $3 in the App Store, uh, but it's totally worth it. And then Starwalk is another one that some of my teammates use. Um, and I believe you can get it for Apple or Android phones. And then Stellarium Mobile is a free app. Um, and you can also use it on your desktop. Uh, it's an open source um, uh, astronomy program that is just so comprehensive. And it's a really great one um, as well. So um, I hope that this kind of gives you uh, 
what you might need to get started or it told you some things that you uh, maybe didn't think about before and you're able to make the most of your uh, stargazing nights that you want to do. So thank you guys so much. And thank I'm going to pass it Amanda. back to appreciate it. So um, let's see, I have a, a quick question. We are a homeschooling family of three. Do we need a minimum number of people to constitute a field trip? Um, you do not need to have um, a minimum number to do an educational trip here. And uh, for our educational uh, field trip information or to try and plan something like that, you're going to email uh, planetarium at uh, malin.edu and I'm the one that will help coordinate all of that for you uh, so if you have any questions just shoot me an email to that awesome. perfect we have the right person <laughs> <laughs> um, I have an unusual one I'm moving to Australia soon is it true that their constellation skies are upside down when compared to ours so um, that's a really good question so there are uh, because they're, of course, the northern and southern hemispheres, we experience up in the northern hemisphere an entirely different sky um, than the southern hemisphere does. And some of our constellations kind of cross that equator area, and uh, but some of them never do. So there's a whole set of of sky that you have to travel to the Southern hemisphere to get to enjoy. And it's on my bucket list because there's um, all kinds of things down there that I've just never gotten to see like this large and small Magellanic clouds and, and things like that. So yes, it will be a, a different sky than what you're used to seeing here. Awesome. Um, and then someone asked if we come from far away, would we be able to see the Milky Way without any equipment? Yes. You definitely will. Summertime is the best time to see the most contrasted and bright version of it because of where we actually sit in the in our galaxy during the seasons. We're turned um, we're turned facing the center of of the Milky Way during the summertime, and that's why that band is so much more contrasted. But no, you do not need equipment to see it. Wonderful. We just like to say thank you for joining us. Hope you hope you can get up there to the Earth to Sky Park. Um, enjoy the parkway. <laughs>